Hey guys, it's Alexander Williamson here with the secret history living in your aquarium, your park, your world, your local ecosystem. And today, I want to ask you, if I were to go to the local water source, lake, river, estuary, ocean, the nearest one to where you are right now, and I were to pick up any creature out of that body of water, what are the chances that you'd know what it, what it is? You'd know the Latin name. All right, even you fish experts, what are the chances? I don't know. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of species in any given ecosystem, be that the Atacama Desert, the driest place on Earth, or be that, you know, the Amazon rainforest or uh, some of the densest places on Earth for biodiversity. But we constantly are funding trips to go explore these strange and wonderful out of the ray place and oftentimes we forget what's living right in our own backyards. So I've brought you today to a bog here in the city of Seattle and it is a bog that used to once be full of uh, peat moss and obviously peat and all sorts of rich nutrients for plants and animals, lots of uh, gases of decomposition, as well as very fertile ground um, for plants such as cranberries and other berries that float in the area, for tuber plants that Native Americans utilized, and for that matter, the peat itself they often used as a fuel source or to keep a flame uh, or ember smoldering. Now, in another video I recently did, well, six months ago or so, you can come and see me talking about the bioremediation that's been going on here, how this was once a Superfund site where a gas station leaked and this area was devastated. There was a gasoline shimmer on every surface and death all over the ground for decades. Not even the Canadian geese, the Canada geese as, as they're properly called, uh, would land. And yet this piece of water, as we walk out here you'll see, is connected to rivers and creeks that go all the way out to Lake Washington to the Salish Sea or Puget Sound and it's an active environment. You can see the bubbles coming up, the gas coming up. There are over a dozen species of fish known in this water and when we go out looking for new species or exotic new nano fish and exciting new uh, life be it plants or fungi or animals. There's a big blind spot we have, and that is in the creatures that are right at our feet. So last year, a whale was discovered. A new species of whale was discovered off of Baja, California or Mexico as it's known in its national border and boundary and somehow we had missed this whale because it lived in such a specific niche and we've called this the rice whale uh, this group of whales and it turns out there's only a few hundred of them left unfortunately but at least we know that they exist or existed now, one of my favorite new fish in my tanks, in the hobby, is the Schismatogobius amapluviculus. Hard to say, right? But, 
That is a Taiwanese and Indonesian, all the way to the southern Japanese islands, uh, located. It's that's its habitat and range. It's a little goby that's only an inch to an inch and a half long. And with all the years that people have been exploring, living, fishing, I mean, Japan is one of the biggest fishing cultures in the world. They adore fish, eat fish. Something like 60% of the Japanese diet, the protein, is sourced from seafood and fish. Yet, in Taiwan and Japan, there was no name, no Latin name, for the little inch and a half long goby that can change color within a half second, that can burrow under the sand, that can move its eyes, it has UV uh, filtering vision, it can track movement better than almost any other little fish, and we're just now learning about it, this little burrowing predator that, that hides, waits, and pops out in ambushes. They're really fun to watch, and I did a video on them. If you're interested, I can link it at the end of this. But the point being is that on an island like Taiwan or Japan or Okinawa or any of the places where this specific species is found, there are thousands of scientists and dozens if not hundreds of ichthyologists in the Japanese culture and from around the world that come there to study what's going on in their nature. Yet, nobody saw this little fish and thought that's important. It wasn't an economic commodity. It wasn't an indigenous food source. It wasn't seen as a keystone species to anything that important indigenously. But as people have become passionate and interested in new things like nanofish in their aquariums, all of a sudden you can get five, 10, $15 for a little inch, inch and a half, three to five centimeter long fish. And there's incentive to look down at your feet and say, what do we have going on here? Now I'm not saying that scientists and ecologists, biologists, ichthyologists, that they're not always looking anyways, they are. But what have we missed because there wasn't incentive to find it? Why would we need a marker other than that little fish? That little fish that hangs out on the rocks that's gray. And that other one that's striped in gray. And that other one that's silver and gray. Or black and gray. Well, maybe they're completely different. Maybe one's venomous. Maybe one has chromatophores in its skin that allows it to change color at the drop of a hat. And there's neurological properties going on that may have implications in how we can heal brain injuries in humans by diffusing the neural network within non-brain tissue. Maybe there's a venom. And maybe, like we have so many times before, maybe there is an economic motive. Maybe that needs to be found. Uh, maybe there's a blood thinner or a blood thickener, something that causes your blood to clot when you have something wrong where it's too thin or vice versa. It's actually been venoms and poisons that have given us the antidote and the solution to how we solve many of these problems. And if these species were killed or never discovered, how would we have known any of that? You never know when a connection is going to be made between something seemingly unrelated and something going on on the other side of the world. In the Caribbean, there were thought to be two types of iguanas. There's the Eastern Iguana and the Green Iguana in the uh, Caribbean, Caribbean uh, Sea. Well, it turns out that there are 
possibly up to eight, and definitely five species now that we've sequenced their DNA. There's a species with pink spots on it. There's a striped species. There's another dark spotted species. There is a western uh, lesser Antilles species. There's some that eat in the water and can catch fish and crabs and crustaceans at the banks of the ocean. There's others that hang out in the trees and lounge and eat fruits and plants and anything else they can get at. And when do you draw the line between those species speciating? At some point, someone got on a log and floated from, say, Jamaica to Haiti, wherever, you know, to Trinidad, to Tobago, to the mainland of Venezuela, or back the other way if we're not talking about fish. Fish sometimes will go from the ocean to inland in the case of guppies for instance or endlers. But what is our incentive? What is your incentive to cover what's going on in the waters around your house? I want to challenge you to find out, be it online, there's plenty of good local resources Find out in your nearest body of water that has fish. On this little lake here, this bog that's being rehabilitated, that is still poisoned with hydrocarbons, oil, fossil fuels, gasoline, uh, and pesticides, all sorts of things, there are 12 species that have made their way through a creek and have been reintroduced via nature they were not stocked here the only species that's been stocked here were some carp that someone threw in here in the 70s and they've lived through the worst of the pollution but now we have perch we have pea mouths we have sunfish we have uh we have uh war mouths we have just fascinating you know, smallmouth bass. Uh, someone said they saw a trout and uh, that they had caught a trout in here. And those are the species that we all know. But who's to say that we don't have a salamander? We don't have a small uh, dace, like the speckled dace, that only occur sometimes in one creek, in one river, in, in one area. This area right here, right up the road, there's a place called Licton Springs, and it is a geothermal uh, heated water source, not very warm, but it, it has completely different water properties than all of this other water that drains here that's based off of rain uh, drainage. And who knows what creatures may have settled in that area who knows how long they may be isolated in one neighborhood. If a whale can exist in an area that's inundated with tourists and boat traffic off the Baja Peninsula, a whale, something that is thousands of pounds swimming through the water, if that can exist in a bay, in a gulf alone. It doesn't go out into the open sea. What sort of little inch long or centimeter long, two centimeter, five centimeter, ten centimeter long fish creatures could still be here and just nobody's described them? In the Philippines last year, a seven inch snake. That's pretty cute, isn't it? 6.8 inches long maximum was the longest individual they found in that species. But it turns out it was living in Manila. The Somfong or Somfongzi rasbora, they thought was a fish that lived south of Bangkok in Thailand. And it turns out in 2006, they found two males and one female shipped in from the waterways of the city, the polluted waterways of Bangkok, the city proper. And 
at Aquarium Glosser, one of their importing sources, somebody recognized that another German had described the Somfong Zirasbora and it had not been seen in the wild, was assumed to be extinct. And yet with those three fish, they managed to spawn literally hundreds of thousands of them over the next decade to the point in which I have them in my aquarium now and they bring me joy. But who's to say what will not be unlocked what mysteries will not be solved, which keystone species are not even known, what new medical science or biomimicry in international defense, you, you name it, you pick what it is that's important to you. And there is a case I can cite you where we used something in nature to inform our technology or our thinking on the subject of what to do, how to solve the problem. So I'm challenging you guys, all you ladies, gentlemen, children, elders, and in between, to go out and learn 10 species, 10 Latin names of fish from your waterways, salt water or fresh water, but learn them and then keep an eye out for them. And then if something new that you didn't know, now I don't want you to go out and learn rainbow trout or cod or tuna or marlin or whatever it is that you already know or have a good handle on. I want you to really go out there and think about a species when you're flipping through your local guidebooks or maybe some county or state resources on the different species going on, even if it's invasive. I want you to look at it carefully and try to learn really how to identify it. How many dorsal rays does it have on its uh, dorsal fin? How many uh, pectoral uh, spiny protrusions does it have? Just one? I mean, how many rays does it have behind that? How many dots? Does it have a broken lateral line or a continuous lateral line? Is it brackish or freshwater? I mean, there are a million things to know, but just equate yourself with the fish. And then if you're in your area and something appears that's just not quite right to that description that you learn, that you know so well, maybe you can bring it to the attention of someone uh, in the taxonomy world, in the biology world. And beyond just teaching yourself the awesome skill of being able to identify plants, animals, fish, insects, fungi, whatever it is, there's different uh, feels to learning each group. And fish definitely have characteristics where they're kind of an interchangeable choose your own adventure uh, layout of options, you know, be it saltwater, freshwater, brackish water, uh, continuous lateral line, broken lateral line, uh, non visible lateral line, armored, scaled, no uh, scales, no armor, just skin. And I want you to go and learn those things about those 10 species. And that will teach you so much about all these other species that you're not even trying to learn about. And uh, you'll have the ability to quite possibly find something new that's just been overlooked. It is assumed that out of all the fish known in the world with Latin names, that we haven't even named half of them. Now, a lot of them are at the bottom of the ocean. They're variants that maybe genetics will have to reveal. But many, many cases from Central Park to the Philippines to the Caribbean, you name it, from the size of a whale to the size of a shrew, we have discovered species that were right there at our feet the entire time and because they were not of a monetary significance or uh, 
not seen to be integral to the part of the environment uh, that was important to the locals, they are overlooked. So as we're looking here, we see these white flowers. As far as the eye can see, these white flowers. These little daisies or whatever they are. I don't know. I need to learn. And all of a sudden, boom, we've got red ones. We've got pink ones. We've got red ones with yellow centers like these and very fine petals growing in a cluster right next to them. We also have pinkish or purple ones. We have broadleaf ones. And when do you draw the line between a hybridized species and an all new species? It's very hard sometimes. Here we have all those traits, broad and narrow together. Narrow on the inside, broad on the outside. Pink on the outside, darker red on the tips as it gets bigger, looking almost like a chrysanthemum or something. And then white at the center. All growing from the same little tuft of the same shaped leaves. And yet, as far as we can see, those are the only ones. And I've been walking around this park for weeks. And just along this fence line for about 12 feet, do you find a few of them that have this trait? So, what is it that you're going to find? Get excited about it. Get out there and learn. Get out there and find new and interesting things, if not to the world, just to you. Thank you for watching The Secret History Living in Your Aquarium tonight. And remember to stay in touch with the natural world around you even if it is an oil-filled, super fun site. There's life, there's adaptation, and sometimes it's the most overlooked places that have the most people. I mean, Taiwan, there's millions and millions of people living on that island, and that little Gobi was overlooked until 1995 as even a group let alone a species which took until 2017. So we're nowhere near the end of the limits of our knowledge and what we will learn, and you can have a part in expanding that. Ask new questions every day, and again, write your favorite species you found locally in the comments if you actually go and do this little assignment that I've put forth. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you guys another time soon. Take care, good luck, good night, goodbye.